Can you all hear me? Perfect. So, hello everyone. Welcome to Physics Society for this term. I'm also on behalf of myself, on behalf of the new committee from now on. Welcome to our society. Just before we begin, I'd like to say we have a lot of fun things planned for this year, and we're all really excited to be taking a look from what a brilliant job last year's committee has done. Just to give you a heads up for this term, we have a lot more talks also planned. There is a social tomorrow at St. Giles. Be aware of that. We'd like to see all of you there tomorrow. And as it's Trinity, we know everyone's busy with exams and things. So as we come to a close for the term, we want to do a few more social type activities. So not necessarily just hang around talking. We'll try and put an event in something. Something fun, we hope we'll have a bit of fun before exams. So keep an eye on your emails and on the Instagram and Facebook pages for that to be soon. As for today, we are very privileged to have Professor Stephen Simon with us today. He's an American theoretical physicist who's been at Oxford since 2009, with a particular focus on topological quantum computing and space of matter. And we're really pleased to have him here today to talk to you about the story of anions. So that's enough of me talking for today. I'll now hand over to Professor Stephen Simon, and I hope you will enjoy. Thank you. years of experimentally observing some of these things which haven't been observed before. Um, our story starts in 1924 in India. Uh, a man by the name of Satyendra Bose sends a letter, a famous letter, to Albert Einstein. And the letter reads, Respected Sir, I have ventured to send you the accompanying article. And he asked Einstein to help him get the paper published in the leading journal of the time, Ledger for Shindy. Um, he continues on and he says, Though a complete stranger to you, I do not feel any hesitation in making this request. What Bose had done is he had managed to derive um, Planck's black body radiation formula, the formula that tells you how much power in uh, radiation is emitted from a black body at a given temperature. Now, people knew how to sort of hand wave and derive this, but no one knew how to derive it from first principles, and Bose had managed to do it by treating photons as, as um, indistinguishable or identical, identical particles in a, in a certain way. Now, Einstein was already quite famous at this time. He probably received a lot of junk mail. Uh, they didn't have spam back then, but they had junk mail, certainly. But he realized uh, right away that this was a very important calculation that had been done. And he generalized it beyond just photons, massive particles. You could also have uh, massive particles that behave the same way. And this is what we now call call bosons, a particular type of, of particle. Um, um, now, the very next year, uh, Pauli formulated his uh, Pauli exclusion principle, Pauli, um, which tells us that there are other types of particles, particularly electrons, that um, behave differently where you cannot put more than one uh, identical particle in the, in the same orbital at the same, at the same time. Now, as soon as Pauli's exclusion principle was, was formulated, it was clear what one had to do. One had to generalize Bose's calculation to deal with this other type of uh, particle. And that was done, um, and the result was what we call Fermi-Dirac statistics. Fermi-Dirac statistics of fermions. It was, uh, the calculation was first done neither by Fermi nor Dirac, but by Pascal Jordan. Um, Jordan. And it's a bit of a historical accident why it is that it's named after Fermi and Dirac, and not, not uh, after Jordan. This is an example of Stiglitz's law. Stiglitz's law tells you that nothing is actually named after the person who actually invented it. Stiglitz's law was invented by Merton. <laughs> but, uh, so anyway, um, the story of, uh, of Jordan is that Jordan learned of, of the Pauli exclusion principle and, and realized how it is you should generalize uh, Bose's, Bose's calculation. Um, and he went about it and he wrote a paper and he submitted it to a journal and the 
the journal sends it to a referee. We now know in retrospect that referee was Max Born. Max Born was a very brilliant man, a, a, a later Nobel laureate. He was also the grandfather of Olivia Newton John, a great pop singer for the American Navy. She passed away earlier last year. Um, that's a little bit irrelevant. But anyway, Max Born, besides being uh, a, a great physicist, was also a little bit forgetful. He took this, this paper, which had been sent to him, um, and stuck it in his um, briefcase with the best of intentions of reading it and writing some report as to whether it was correct or not. Um, but then he forgot about it. And it sat in his briefcase for about a year and a half, after which he opened up his briefcase and realized that he had forgotten about this paper. And during that time, Fermi and Dirac had already discovered and published uh, the correct result. So Jordan didn't get credit. Now the physics community and the science community in general is usually pretty good at correcting errors of attribution. So under normal circumstances, we would go back and we would say, okay, Fermi Dirac, Fermi Dirac Jordan statistics, or Jordan Fermi Dirac statistics in order to give Jordan appropriate credit. But that actually didn't happen. There's another bit of a historical accident. The reason it didn't happen is because shortly thereafter, Jordan became a very prominent Nazi. And nobody liked him. <laughs> And no one felt the, the need to do him any favors and change the change the name for the uh, statistic. Actually, rather ironically, Jordan was probably entitled to part of another Nobel Prize with, with Max Born. Max Born um, felt terribly guilty about having robbed Jordan of his credit, although he, he said that he completely disagreed with any of his political opinions, he still felt very guilty about having done this terrible thing. Anyway, there's a moral to this story because don't become Nazis. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, most of quantum mechanics was finished by around 1930. If you want to think about quantum field theory, that was finished more or less by, by 1950. And after that time, you might ask, well, didn't, didn't people think about whether they could have other particles besides uh, bosons, like photons, or, or fermions, like, like electrons? And, and people did think about this question. Um, and over and over, they came to the same conclusion that you can't. You can only have bosons or fermions. Now, there's a fairly um, brief argument that's given in most quantum mechanics textbook about why it is that this is the case. It's a similar argument, so I'm going to give you the argument, give you the argument now. Let's imagine a wave function for two particles, identical particles, um, at positions R1 and R2, and these are, these are identical particles at, at, at two different positions. You can't say which particles at which position because they're identical, but you know they are two particles at two positions. The probability of finding your particle position R1 and R2 is a square of this, of this wave function in, in the usual way. So then what you do is you define an, an operator, it's called E hat, um, E hat, which is equal to the exchange operator, which we call exchange which takes R1 to R2. In other words, you take the two particles and you switch their positions. Okay? Now, the usual argument goes that if you do that procedure twice, E has squared, you switch the position once and then you switch them back, you get back to the original configuration. So that should be the identity of R1. Switching twice is the same as not having done anything uh, at all. Well, one has exactly two square roots, plus or minus one, and so that means you only have, have two possibilities of the kind of um, behaviors that particles can exhibit. If, if you have a plus one, we say you have bosons. If it's minus one, we say it is, it is fermions. And in particular, if let's take the, the fermion case, fermion, um, fermion is the minus one case where a side of R1 R2 is minus psi of R2 R1. In particular, that implies psi of R1 R1 has to equal zero in any symmetric function, it has to be zero at, at the origin. And that is just the uh, Pauli exclusion principle in action telling you you can't put two identical fermions at, at the same position. The amplitude of having them at the same position is, is, is zero. And this is a rather dramatic difference between bosons like electrons and, and fermions like, like photons. If it weren't for the Pauli exclusion principle, we wouldn't have atoms, we wouldn't have all the chemistry. I mean, everything that we don't love depends on the Pauli exclusion principle in some ways. All right, 
So anyway, this argument in all the common kind of sex book was believed to hold for many, many years, and it was improved upon and in various different ways. And over and over, people came to the conclusion that all you have is bosons and fermions and nothing else. And that stood until 1977. So in 1977, in a rather uh, important, but at the time not really noticed paper, by two people, both named Jan, living in, in Oslo, uh, probably not going to spell the names right. So the first is Jan Magnus Linus, Linus, L-I-N-A-A-S, and the other one is Jan Merheim, Merheim um, wrote a uh, actually, you might, you might extrapolate from this and conclude that everyone who lives in Oslo who is male um, is named Jan. Um, this, is, this is not true, I've checked. Um, <laughs> but Jan actually is the most common name for a male in Oslo, but it's followed closely by Per and Bjorn. And um, so it's actually just a little bit of a coincidence that both of them happen to be named Jan, but okay. Um, that's also a little relevant. So anyway, they wrote this paper whose content is basically in 2 plus 1b, and here I'm using the notation of physicists like two spatial dimensions and one time dimension, so we're thinking about a flat plane plus time. Uh, there are other things. There are other things. Meaning things that are not bosons and, and not fermions. And the kind of thing they had in mind is, is the following situation. So here's our two-dimensional plane. And we have two particles in the two-dimensional plane, and we exchange their position counterclockwise like this. And if we exchange counterclockwise, the wave function picks up a phase e to the i theta. Whereas if we have the same picture over here, and we exchange the two particles clockwise instead, the wave function picks up a phase e to the minus i theta. And the, the value of theta is a property of the type of particles we're considering. And it's uh, really crucial here that the phase that you accumulate depends only on the fact that you've exchanged them clockwise and counterclockwise, and not on the detailed path. It doesn't matter if you get a smooth path or a weakly path, as long as you exchange them in the clockwise and counterclockwise direction, you get a phase e to the i theta to the minus i theta. Okay. Um, so you might ask, well, what about this beautiful argument that's in all the quantum mechanics? Where did it go wrong? Um, well, let's think a little bit uh, more carefully um, in terms of space-time diagrams. So we're going to draw uh, time going upwards. You always draw time going upwards because time is money and money goes upwards. Unless you're investing in pounds, where on a seems to put you downwards. Um, but if you have your money in Swiss francs, you can wrap the rest of us with paid in pounds. Anyway, um, so. We have our two-dimensional system here, and we're going to have two particles, and we're going to exchange them here, I guess, counterclockwise. Uh, so they, they counterclockwise like this, and then we bring them back to the same positions, and then we're going to exchange them again, counterclockwise like this. And you'll notice that what we've done is we've made a little bit of a knot in their world lines, that is not equal to two particles that didn't exchange at all. Now, had we done something, something different, had we, um, this, if we exchange them clockwise, uh, actually, sorry, that's uh, counterclockwise again, and then we uh, exchange them the other way, clockwise, so counterclockwise followed by clockwise, that is this, and that can be continuously formed into, in, into this. So if you exchange clockwise followed by counterclockwise, it's, it's the same as not doing anything, but if you exchange clockwise and clockwise, or counterclockwise and counterclockwise, then you made a knot in the world lines, and that's not the same as not doing anything. Okay? Um, so you might say, okay, that's, that's interesting, but wouldn't the same argument work in, in three plus one dimensions? And in fact, in three plus one dimensions, um, three plus one dimensions, there's an important topological statement 
which um, prevents this kind of argument from, from working in, in, in the sense that you, you can't make knots in world lines. So in 3 plus 1b, um, there are no knots in world lines, in world lines, or we can just make a more mathematical statement in 4d, no knots in 1d objects. And you cannot tie your shoes in four dimensions, you cannot make a knot. Um, now, this statement probably sounds completely obtuse to some people, but to other people it probably sounds completely obvious. It's one of these things where it becomes obvious if you think about it, if you've thought about it before, you probably say, oh yeah, that's obvious, if you've never thought about it before, you probably say that's not obvious. So let me try to make it obvious to, to everyone. Um, unfortunately, I can't draw anything in, in four dimensions, even if I had the advantage of PowerPoint, I would still not be able to do it. Um, so let me try to argue by, by a lower dimensional analog. Um, let's take one plus one dimension. Um, and so we have a line, and I'm going to have two particles on the line here and here. And I'm going to move the particles towards each other like this. And I want to take them through each other and move them to the other side. Okay? And the question is, can you do that without the particles crashing into each other? And the answer should obviously be no. You cannot do that. You cannot do that. They must crash. Crash. Okay. Let's change the rules a little bit. Now let's do two plus one D. Okay, I have my two particles on a line. But I'm allowing you to move in two dimensions, two spatial dimensions, rather than one spatial dimension, because I get them by each other. Well, yes, of course I can. I can just move this guy off into the additional dimension, and then this guy this way, and this guy down this way, and then he gets by the other guy without touching. Everyone happy with that? Okay, good. Um, now let's think about world lines. So world lines um, in two plus one. So again, time's going, going vertically, and we imagine we have two world lines that look like this in, uh, in our 2 plus 1 dimensions. Now, can I deform this overcrossing to turn it into an undercrossing without having those lines crash into each other? Well, if I fix the endpoints here, 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 and here, um, they're not. You can't take an overcrossing into an undercrossing without, you know, having those, those lines crash into it. You can make a knot in, in two plus one dimension. Everyone happy with that? Yeah, good. So these crash. Okay? But in three plus one dimensions, three plus one D, um, I can take uh, uh, oh, what appears to be an overcrossing like this. Then I'm going to displace this little chunk of string a little bit into the additional direct dimension, just like I did up there slide it a little bit past, and then reconstitute it on the other side until it looks like this. And they never touch. Right? So, there's no crash. Okay. Everyone happy with that? Okay. So that, what that tells us is if I have one-dimensional world lines here, living in a total of four dimensions, I can't make a knot. Why is that important? The reason that's important is it, it means that you can never leave something non-trivial behind. All knots can be undone, and the only thing you can say about a particular way of exchanging particles is either they exchanged or they didn't exchange. You can't say they exchanged in a particular way, because all ways of exchanging are the same. Okay? There's no, there's no, the thing that went wrong with our argument way up at the top, the thing that went wrong is that we said up there that e squared equals 1. And in 2 plus 1 dimensions, you have to say more than just saying the particles exchange. You have to say whether the particles exchange clockwise or they exchange counterclockwise. But in 3 dimensions, clockwise and counterclockwise are the same thing. Because you can always undo those knots. So you don't have to specify it. So the argument way up top that exchange squared equals 1, that holds water more or less in 3 plus 1 dimensions given some other caveats about being able to do scalars, blah, 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 um, whereas it doesn't fold in two plus one dimensions. Okay? Is that clear? 
Okay, good. So, this is what was discovered in 1977, important breakthrough paper by the two Jans in Oslo, and this paper was so important that it was completely ignored. No one paid any attention to it whatsoever. Um, uh, it was, over the first five years of its existence, it was cited uh, five times by the Nice and Marheim themselves, and I believe by no one else. Um, so no one paid any attention. In 1981, um, the result was re-derived by Golden, Medicock, and Sharp. Uh, these are mathematicians who came to the same result. Um, now, Landau had an expression for this. He said it was re-derived independently. They had no knowledge that an ISMR had done this already. Um, independently, but later. By which he meant, you don't get any credit if you didn't read the literature. You should have read the literature and noticed that this has been done before. So, anyway, they get partial credit for having to rewrite it independently. And actually what they did was, was also kind of interesting in its own right, because they used a different technique to derive it. The technique they used was based on work of uh, Laidlaw, and I'm going to write it down, uh, Lorette and Witt. Lorette and Witt is the brain behind this. Uh, so Witt has a small b. Um, so this is uh, Cecile. Um, Lorette DeWitt. Um, so she grew up in, um, in, in France during World War II, during which a, a lot of her family actually was killed. But she was in university and escaped uh, bad face during, um, during the war, and was identified as being extremely smart and went to work with the Joliet Curies, who were quite famous already, and then was sent on to work with, um, with Schrodinger and then Oppenheimer, and she became one of the founders of on the field here. Anyway, Moret de Witt became interested in this question in 1971. Moret de Witt is also the, um, uh, she's politically, uh, was very astute, and she uh, created a, a school of uh, physics and mathematics called Les Douches up in the French Alps. She got that funded by, um, by the French government. She had some, some comments about it's easy to convince people in, in government uh, to do anything you want. Because they're, they're, they're all men and they're stupid. Um, you just have to convince them of their idea, and of course they give it money. So, anyway, she was very proud of that thing, this, this uh, school funded. It's a fantastic school if you really get a chance to go there. Uh, an enormous number of very famous physicists and mathematicians have been, have been trained at. Um, anyway, so they're used to that as Moret DeWitt, and Moret DeWitt was also interested in 71 about this question about why is it you only have uh, bosons. And, and fermions, and she was trying to drive the field theory of form, formalism. And she actually, in, in, this, in this paper, they comment that the technique they use doesn't work in two plus one dimensions. So something must be different. But then they stop. And they didn't pursue it to its you know, logical conclusion. They just weren't interested in it. And so it had to wait uh, till these guys and, and, and these guys. Anyway, so that was 81. And no one paid any attention to this either, but in 1982, um, Frank Wilczek um, became interested in this problem. And he was aware of, of both of these works. Frank Wilczek was, a, um, was already quite famous. He um, proved asymptotic freedom, something very important for the Quark model. Um, he would later win a Nobel Prize for this. And everyone knew, knew about him, and everyone sort of followed what he was working on. And as soon as Wolchek became interested in this problem, um, a lot of other people became interested in the problem as well. Among other things, Wolchek coined the, the word anion to describe these particles, which are not bosons or fermions. It's, it's anything else on. That was sort of a joke. Um, the, name, the name stuck. And once uh, Wolchek became interested in this problem, a lot of people became interested in this problem. So, um, Another historical accident that in 1982 um, was also the discovery, experimental discovery, of fractional quantum Hall effect. Fractional quantum uh, Hall effect. Effect um, by Stewie Stormer and, and Gossard, uh, two of them who later made a Nobel Prize for this discovery. Um, the following year, in 1983, was uh, the theory of fractional quantum Hall effect, theory of, um, by Bob Laughlin, 
So while Moffin won a Nobel Prize and Moffin is an astronomer, Gossip does not win the Nobel Prize. That's a complicated story about why it is two of won the Nobel Prize but the third didn't. Um, anyway, so the theory of uh, Firestone Hall effect was 1983, and then 1984, um, the year, there were two groups. The first group was this uh, Bert Halpern, um, the disclosure, he was my uh, PhD's supervisor, although many years later, after this, um, I'm quite that old. Um, and the other group was our bus speaker and Wilczek, our We'll check. Um, um, so Schrieffer is a Nobel laureate already for uh, developing the theory of superconductivity. We'll check would later be a Nobel laureate for his work on asymptotic freedom in the part model. Arbus was the graduate student who inevitably did all the work. <laughs> You'll probably find it less funny when you're a graduate student. Anyway, the Arbus had a guy. Quite a, quite a good career himself, so he got a lot of credit for this. Anyway, um, what they actually showed was the low energy excitations, excitations of fraction from Hall effect at QHE are anions. <coughs> so, fraction from Hall effect is something that occurs in two dimensional electron systems, and I'll say a little bit more about it um, coming up. And it's, it's really a sort of, you know, sort of an amazing coincidence. No one ever thought about particles living in two dimensions and how they might be non bosons and non fermions until 1977. And by 1984, just a few years later, we had an example of them that was, was discovered. Now, this statement was a theoretical statement, but it was a very convincing theoretical statement. All the theoretical evidence and all the numerical evidence that we could come up with supported this, this statement that the excitations in fractal quantum Hall effect really are, are anions. But what was lacking for a very long time was experimental proof of this. What one wanted to do was exactly this experiment, where you take two particles, move them around each other, and measure the phase, and show that it's not plus one or minus one. Okay? Um, so that took until 2020. 2020 experiment. And what's particularly interesting is it wasn't just one experiment, it was several experiments, um, kind of at the same time, using very different techniques, which all managed to do this experiment um, finally. And it wasn't for lack of trying along the way, but there were a lot of attempts along the way that failed, and just the technology advanced far enough that all of a sudden we could we could do it in several different ways. Now, before I'm going to explain some of these experiments, um, okay, I've got time. Um, I might want to explain before I do that why we care so much about um, uh, anions. One is that they're of fundamental interest. You know, that we as physicists, and, and particularly as condensed matter physicists, which is what I am, um, we're interested in what kind of things can exist, what kind of particles can exist, what kind of matter can exist. And you know, anions are one of them, so we'd like to study them. And since the original proposal that fractional quantum Hall particles have uh, are anions, there have been other cases where people believe that there could be anions running around in experiments, in particular spin liquids and various types of, of super superfluids. So that's one fundamental reason why they should want to study anions. Um, there's something else that came along in the, in the late nineties. Um, which is there's a very intimate connection between anions and quantum memories. So what's a quantum memory? So if you think about your computer or laptop or phone, the, they sort of have two main parts. One is the memory where the information is stored, and the other is the processor which does some sort of operations on the, uh, on the memory. Now, if you're going to build a quantum computer, you have to do the same thing, but you need a quantum memory and a quantum processor. These are much harder to, to think about. But what was shown by Alexei Kitaev, one of the um, you know, great modern geniuses of, of, of physics, um, is that if you have a system of anions, you have a very effective and protect, particularly robust against noise quantum memory. So if you have anions, you can build a quantum memory that would work very, very well. The following year, so around 1998, Kitaev and, and, and Michael Friedman showed that you could 
sort of, so Michael Friedman is a um, mathematician, a very famous mathematician. He won the Fields Medal for his work on the Quantum Ray Conjecture in the 1980s. Um, the same year he won the Fields Medal for Quantum Ray Conjecture. He um, also won the United States Rock Climbing Championship. <laughs> um, but um, anyway, uh, so the, the, both of them realized that not only can you use uh, anions as a quantum memory, but you can also use it as a quantum processor. That by dragging anions around, the right type of anion around this, each other in certain patterns, you can actually do quantum computations. So this idea, you know, this topological quantum computation, the idea of taking anions, dragging them around each other to build a quantum computer, gained a lot of traction in the physics community. And um, many of the ideas that grew from this are still very, um, very important. In particular, the Microsoft Corporation um, liked the idea, and they started investing money into building quantum computers out of, out of anions. As of yet, I mean, I don't know exactly how much Microsoft has spent on this, but it's easily in the hundreds of millions of dollars, considering how many people they're employing to work on this and, and how much they're paying and the kind of resources they need. So they sort of, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of investment has gone into building these sort of topological quantum computing. We're still a long way from um, having a real one, but they made a lot of progress in some sense. Okay, anyway, the types of experiments uh, have come in several, several varieties. Um, they have actually observed these, these anions as sort of rating behavior and doing this kind of experiment. So one variety is within fractional quantum Hall effect. Um, so there's two experiments that happened in 2020. One is known as the anion collider experiment uh, by the Michael Febbs group in, in Paris. And the other is, is the, called the anion interferometer. And it was done by Michael Lampo's group in, in Purdue, in Indiana, in the United States. Um, I will talk about the second one of those, the, the anion inter interferometer. But at the same time, more or less the, the same year, um, modern quantum computers have become sufficiently powerful that they can more or less produce anions within the computer. Now, what do I mean by that? So you, what you're really doing is you're sort of simulating matter with the quantum computer. You imagine you know, your computer is a bunch of uh, a bunch of bits in, in a bunch of two-state systems in its memory, and you line it up with some sort of lattice, and you think to yourself, well, wait a second, if it's a bunch of two-state systems in the memory, why isn't that just like you know a bunch of spins in a in you know some material? Where's the dividing line between simulating matter and actually having matter? So it becomes sort of a very fuzzy difference between a simulation of matter and an actual type of matter. Um, but the quantum processors that people now have from companies like, like Google, the, there's a Chinese group who has a machine called Zhushang Zi, which I probably mispronounced, but, but the, the name Zhushang Zi is, if someone's almost laughing at me because I pronounced it wrong, but, but anyway, the, um, um, I, I believe it's, it's a reference to a, a Chinese philosopher but it, who has the same name. Um, for this word. Um, there's a number of people at universities and, and a couple of other companies, IBM, Honeywell, who also been able to, to, to do this. And it was around 2020 when they were able to simulate matter that has anions in it and then bring, bring these uh, particles around each other and measure the, the phases. So since the uh, simulation of matter is sort of on a slightly different foot, although it's, it's moving along quite well, and there's lots of exciting, uh, exciting work in that, in that domain. I'm not going to talk about it anymore. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, uh, inc incidentally, if, if, just stop me if you have any questions, because I'm happy to, happy to answer questions. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to discuss the anion interferometer experiment in, in some detail, okay? Um, to give you an idea of what it is that has been done. Okay, so, so first of all, I have to say a couple words about fractional quantum Hall effect. Fractional Hall effect. So first thing you need is you need two-dimensional light points. Um, so how do you get two-dimensional light points? Um, so conventionally the way you do it is, is you construct a semiconductor. You, you create the semiconductor materials of atomic layer by atomic layer. You lay down one atomic layer at a time and you sort of grow the material up you know, into three dimensions. 
and you can control each layer of atoms uh, separately. And the idea is you make a very thin layer of atoms that are different from the layers around it. The layers around it are insulators, and the layer, um, the, the thin slice, which are a sandwich of conductor inside, you know, insulators. And so you have a very thin layer where electrons can run around, and so you have a strictly two-dimensional uh, layer. So that's how you get your two-dimensional uh, electrons. Now, in the modern era, there's a second method for doing it, which has turned out to be potentially more powerful, and people have just really just been going in, in doing this. And this is known as the Scotch tape method. Have you heard about the Scotch tape method? Yeah, so uh, someone told me rather recently that it's actually that's not the brand of tape that works. You have to use a different brand of tape. Scotch tape actually fails, and whatever, it's some other brand that, you know, that, that works. But anyway, you take a, a, a bit of uh, a tape, you stick it on a material like, like graphite, and you just pull off one atomic layer of, of atoms, and then you stick it down somewhere else, and you have a, a beautiful single layer uh, of atoms. And, you know, surprisingly, this actually works. It seems, it seems, it seems insane, um, but it works. And, and what's, in order to see fractional polymorphic in the experiment, your system has to be extremely clean. There can't be any disorder, there can't be any dust, there can't be any impurities. And you know, if you're growing your semiconductor layer by layer, you know, the technology that allows people to do this has been developed over the course of the last 60 years. And you know, partially due to the advances in the semiconductor industry, they can make these things extremely pure without very much disorder in it at all. What's crazy is that you can take your dirty piece of, of scotch tape and stick it down on a piece of graphite and get something that's just as good. So, you know, it, it can't, can't be explained, but it, it's one of those things that just works, and so people do it. So anyway, so you can make two-dimensional electron layers, and then you take a two-dimensional electron layer, and you add a big um, magnetic field, field, and then you cool the whole thing down to low temperature, and out comes fractional pump Hall effect, if you're lucky. And when I say low temperature here, I mean around 10 millikelvin above, around above uh, absolute zero temperature. So keep in mind, we live at, at 300 kelvin, so this is 30,000, you know, one thirty thousand of the temperature, of the room temperature. So doing experiments on these temperatures are, is extremely difficult, and you know, it's not for the thing of heart to, to try to do this, but, but something that people do know how to do. Did some work. Anyway, so there's more than one type of fractional compound Hall effect, and they're, you know, you describe them in the following way. Take a parameter, which we usually call nu, the filling, so called filling fraction. This is the ratio of the electron density, let's see, divided by the magnetic field, and then you multiply it by phi naught, which is the flux quantum, is the ratio of Planck's constant divided by the charge of the electron. And um, you, know, you, know, you put in the, the numbers, you realize that this is actually a dimensionless number, a dimensionless ratio. And when this thing is approximately equal to a ratio of small integers, p over q, then you get a uh, fractional Pond Hall effect and anions uh, emerge at low temperature. The actual experiments are usually done at ratios 1 over 3, you move one third. This is the, the, um, the first fractional Pond Hall effect that was observed, 1 over 3. Turns out to be the one that's easiest to see in an experiment. It's the one that's easiest to do experiments on for lots of reasons. So one third is, is the one that we're going to choose. So what kind of experiments do you do on fractional quantum Hall effect? Doing anything at this temperature is extremely hard. Um, but there's one thing that you can do which isn't, isn't too hard. It's the following. So here we have our two-dimensional system that has some, some shape. And we have a plane of board here. Um, and then I feel the board. And then what you can do is you can just um, run a current between two contacts on the end of the system, and you can um, measure a voltage between two other contacts like this. And if you do this experiment um, in uh, when you have fractional quantum Hall effect, you measure voltage equals zero. Um, that's kind of interesting. What does that mean? It means you have some sort of superfluid. Remember that the dissipation is current times voltage, so if the voltage is zero. You have zero dissipation, that means there's no resistance, no viscosity, no friction of any sort. Um, you have currents that will flow forever. Um, so that's kind of an interesting effect, but it's not the most interesting effect. The most interesting effect is you do the same experiment. Okay, is this supposed to be the same sample? Um, and the only thing I'm going to do different 
is I'm going to move the contacts around a little bit. This one over to here, like that. And this one, put it over like this. Measure bolts over here. Okay? So all I did is I, I exchanged these two contacts to each other. Okay? This is a Hall effect experiment, and the voltage you measure is H over E squared. Um, Q over P, that's those, those numbers Q over Q up there, Q upside down, times the current I. So this is a so-called uh, AC and it's quite constant, E is the charge of the electron. This is a so-called quantum Hall resistance. Um, and it's basic, it's okay, so some integers here times some fundamental constants, Planck's constant of electron charge. And if you measure this, it comes out precise to about a part in, in 10 to the 10. That's like saying it comes out precise. It's, measuring something precisely to one part in 10 to the 10 is like measuring the distance from here to Los Angeles to a centimeter. You know, it's, it's absolutely, first of all, it's, it's amazing if you measure anything to one part in 10 to the 10. And the fact that, that you know, this kind of experiment gives you a result that's precise to one part in 10 to the 10 is, is kind of crazy because you don't know anything about the shape of the sample, you don't know anything about how you put the contacts down on the edge of the sample, you, you really have no control of the you know, disorder in the sample, there's going to be all sorts of crazy stuff going on, and yet the result comes out exactly the same as one part in, in 10 to 10. If you compare this to like measuring resistance on like a, a piece of copper, you know, the result that you get out, the voltage you get out, depends entirely on you know, exactly where you put the contacts. On how did you put the contacts on you? Did you solder or this type or solder or that type? So you get a different answer if you measure precisely or not. Um, but in this case, it, it doesn't matter. So that's you know, one of the reasons that quantum Hall effect is interesting. OK, so what we're going to be interested here in is the low energy excitations. These are like little, think about these are like little vortices that live in the, in the fluid. Um, and they have to keep their hand in this. They pick up charges. Um, so the, the fluid sort of spins around, rolls around, and picks up, picks up charges when it does that. And the charges of these low energy excitations charge on these particles. These particles are known as the right? These things are known as quasi particles. And they're called quasi um, because, you know, in some sense they're not real, in some sense they're not real. Back to that issue in a moment. But the quasi particles have charge um, plus or minus P over 3. So these particles have a fraction of the charge of, of an electron. And that should strike you as surprising to begin with because what you put into your system was a bunch of electrons in this layer, and what you've got out of the system is these particles running around which have a fraction of the charge of an electron, one third of the charge of an electron. Now, you know, how should we envisage this? The way we should envisage this is, is that the quantum Hall ground state is some uniform soup of, of electron density. Electrons running around, they form some, some, some superfluid soup of, of uniform electrons. The defects in that soup, these little vortices, like little tornadoes, have a quantized charge, and the charge is a fraction of the charge of, of the electron, okay? Now, um, Okay, so the, the, the reality of the fractional charge has been measured explicitly since the mid-90s. The first measurement was made by um, basically a shot noise experiment. You have a, a thin net and you, and you send um, you know, the, your particles through that thin net and you, know, you discover that the, the charge goes through that, you know, the current comes in, in little packets of charge E over 3. You measure that very well, I say easily, but it was, it was not too hard to do that, to do that experiment. Um, since then, there are other methods that measure the charge as, as well. Now, um, the thing that we're going to be interested in is not the charge, but rather the statistics of these particles. If you take two uh, particles, two of these are particles, and you exchange them in a counterclockwise the manner, you pick up a phase, which is either. 2 pi i over 3. So this is the, the angle theta here for these types of particles, so characterized by this fractional phase. Now, let me return to that issue of, of, the, of the word. Everyone happy with it? With at least the statement so far? Okay. Um, let me come back to this word quasi. 
quantum particles. So people often ask, you know, are these particles real? Are they fundamental? Like, you know, electrons are fundamental. And my answer to that is that that's not a good question. The, and, and there's a reason for that. Um, you know, we like to think of, of certain particles as fundamental, electrons and protons. But we know with protons, that if you if you go to LHC and you probe it at a much higher energy scale, um, you'll discover that it's actually the protons made up of something else. Now we we tried looking at the electrons, see if the electrons made up of something else. So far, at the energy scales that we can access, we don't see it being made up of other things. But that doesn't mean if we go to a higher energy scale, we might not find it made up of, being made up of other things. Now in this case, it's it's not too dissimilar. We have these charges E over 3, um, and the E over 3 is actually made up of, if you look at a higher energy scale, you'll see that the E over 3 particles are actually made up of defects in a soup made of particles whose charges are all E. So it can go either way. The, the, you know, this, this smaller particle can be a higher, higher charge or lower charge than the, the bigger particle. So it's kind of you know, uh, emergent physics that can go in, in either direction. Now, the point here is that whenever you say there's a fundamental particle, you're saying the fundamental particle at a particular energy scale where you can probe the system. So if you were a, you know, a, a two-dimensional being living in the plane of this sample, and you did, and you were at very low energy, low temperature, you know, if you did any experiment that you could access, the only thing you would be able to make is these excitations here. These, these low energy vortices. Those are the only things that you could you could access. Those are the only things you could see. And the fundamental particles to you would be charge E over three. Okay. The same way the fundamental charge to us, you know, at, at our energy scale could be a proton. But if you go to LHC, you'll see a different. You'll see uh, you know you'll see quarks, which are you know, fractions of a proton. It all depends on the effective theory at the energy scale that you can probe. Okay. So. I would say that the word quasi is probably a misnomer. These are just particles at this energy scale. All right. So we need a little bit more information about uh, about fractional quantum Hall effect. Um, some uh, over here. Oops. Um, so we need to know that. Uh, Fractional quantum Hall effect has edges, so one edges. Circles always have edges. Um, so here we imagine having here's my two-dimensional sample. Here's the edge of the sample. So here are electrons down here, electron soup, and then out here, uh, outside of the sample, there's vacuum. And uh, there's a magnetic field uh, through the plane of the board. And I know that there's an electric field uh, pointing in this direction, minus electric field pointing in. Why do I know that? Well, if there weren't such a field, the electrons in here would leak out. They don't leak out because there's an electric field pulling them in. So I know there's an electric field there. Okay? So I know there's an electric field sitting here, there's a magnetic field here, and you know from your the elementary ENM or classical mechanics that when you have E and B perpendicular to each other, there's an E cross B drift velocity, so that everything drifts along. Um, perpendicular to E and B. So if I make a little bump of charge like this, that bump of charge will drift with velocity like this, okay, along the edge. And we're going to use that physics, the fact that these little bumps move along the edge, and the amount of charge in that bump is going to be quantized in units of E over 3 in these little quasi particles. Each bump along the edge is one of these quasi particles, okay? So that's point one that we need to know. Point two, it's, it's not really a, it's more of a technology thing. Um, something you can do with your sample is you can squeeze them down like this until there's an hour and a half, as I mentioned this already. So here are the electrons. This is, is known as a quantum point contact, the QPC, uh, quantum um, point contact. Okay, so you can see why it's called a point contact. And then they just add the word quantum to make it sort of sound cool. Um, I think I'm joking, but really. <laughs> so what happens is that you have, you have these little bumps of charge coming along the edge, and then they get to this narrow neck, and then some fraction of them get reflected back, and some fraction goes on. 
And what's really happening here is that the wave going along is broken into two partial waves. Just like a half silver mirror, you know, you know this in optics, and you have a partial wave that comes back and a partial wave that goes forward. So we're going to be using these quantum point contacts, we have sort of a half silver mirror, and we can start doing optical experiments with these edge lines. Okay? And the kind of um, experiment we're going to do, three, is a fabric grow. Uh, interferometer, it's no such a thing, interferometer. Which means we have two half silver mirrors. Fabric roll means you have two half silver mirrors. Um, this is so the electrons are sitting in here. And the charge bumps can be back reflected here, say the amplitude here is T1, or they can go through here and get back reflected here. We'll say the amplitude is T2. And the, the wave function coming back up here, let's call it psi. The wave function coming back is going to have a part, part proportional to T1 and then a part proportional to T2 times e to the i phi, where phi is the phase that you pick up going around that loop. Okay? Looks like an interferometer. You're familiar with this, this story? Yeah? Okay, good. So the current that you measure coming back, the current back, backscattered current, is the square of this thing. Let's assume T1 and T2 are real. For simplicity, you get T1 squared plus T2 squared plus 2, T1, T2, cosine phi. And what we're going to be interested in is phi. Okay? So you can measure phi by measuring the um, backscattered current. So the backscatter equals psi squared. Psi squared. Okay. All right. Um, good. So, um, so you do this experiment, you measure the current that comes back to you, and then you want to change some things to see interference changes. So one of the things that you can actually change, what, one thing you can change is the length of the cavity. Um, you know, if you move the mirrors further, Part and closer to each other, you should see interference oscillations, constructive followed by destructive interference. Now, in practice, it's not so easy to move the quantum point contacts. So, what they do instead is they lengthen the path by, um, by distorting the edge. You put a little bit of voltage here and to push the edge away. Okay, so you should think of this as, you know, the, the electrons are they're sort of going up a hill, it's sort of like a sea, seashore. You know, there's a seashore here, and they go all the way up the hill to this level. This is the, the edge of the, sea, of the ocean. And then you can make a little bit of a hill by pushing a little bit of a, a little bit of extra voltage here to push electrons away. And you make the electrons walk around this, this hill, so the length that they travel is, is a little bit longer if you push in that, in that edge, okay? So you can change the length of, of the edge if you like. And as a function of length, you see oscillations. So this is J back scattering. You see oscillations that look like this. Okay, so that's interference the way you would expect. Now the second thing you can do um, over here is the second thing you can do is you can. Uh, so this is going to involve. Um, uh, a little bit more information that you need to know, which is if you have a charge, Q, and that charge goes around the flux, magnetic flux, phi, you pick up a phase, um, which is um, e to the i q phi. Okay? This is a quantum mechanical effect known as the Harnoff Ohm effect. The Harnoff Ohm effect, which, um, which was discovered um, by Ehrenberg and Sine. And Sine in, in 1949, 10 years earlier, than Harald Bohm, but it's named after Harald Bohm rather than Ehrenberg and, and Sine um, for, for various, various reasons. Um, another example of, of Steve Bourgeois um, not being named after the people who discovered it. So Ehrenberg um, and, and Sine were both interesting characters. They were interested actually in uh, microscopy. And Ehrenberg was a, 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 well, a Jewish refugee 
um, and he worked in, in, in London, and he, he actually he has an important history in several ways. Everyone probably knows the story of Rosalind Franklin's X-ray um, data, which enabled them to figure out the uh, um, structure of DNA. She, had, she was actually working with Ehrenberg, he was a, an important microscopist, and Ehrenberg built the X-ray apparatus that, that, that she used. It was special design uh, for her to do these experiments. Um, Sidde was um, sort of a gentleman scientist and spent most of his time hanging out in Tahiti, but he would come back and he would hang out with Ehrenberg now and then, and they would have discussions only in pubs. <laughs> but anyway, so they, they wrote this beautiful paper in 1949 explaining this effect that, you, it, that if a charge moves around the fluff, you pick up a quantum mechanical phase, but then it was rediscovered by a hard enough home uh, and home uh, 10 years later. That got named after him. Um, anyway, so you can, you can change the magnetic field in that experiment up there as well. Um, so change the magnetic field a little bit, and again, take back scattering. And since you have a charge moving around a loop, if you change the magnetic field a little bit, the charge goes around the magnetic field. You change, uh, you change the flux that's going around, so you change the phase. And you also see uh, oscillations, OK? Same way. Now, the third thing you can do, and this is the interesting part, is in order to change the phase, is you can insert an additional quasi-particle into the loop. Okay? So why does that uh, do anything? Well, uh, right up there. Oh, no, not up there. Where did it go? Uh, here, right up there. If you insert a quasi-particle into, into the loop, you have one quasi-particle going around the loop, another quasi particle inside the loop, and one went around the other, that's the same as doing this. Right? I mean, this is two exchanges, so you get a phase of phase of four pi i over three. Is that, is that clear? Exchanging twice is the same as one going all the way around the other. So each time you add a quasi particle into the center of the loop, you would pick up the phase of e to the 4 pi i over 3, or e minus 2 pi i over 3, the same thing. Um, and so, if you, um, or 3, is if you add um, one quasi particle in loop, um, phase shifts uh, to phase plus uh, is minus 2 pi over 3. Okay? Good? Happy? All right. So, uh, what's the data in the experiment? I almost have time, but it's perfect. Again, so what they actually do, this is a uh, beautiful paper by Nathan Moran and Nanabrop. Um, so they plot as a function of length of the system and magnetic field. And what they plot is just the position of the peaks here. Okay? Actually, they do a color plot, but I can't draw a color plot anyway. With the chalk, so I'll just draw the position of the peaks. So you see pictures, you see these periodic um, stripes equally spaced like this. So this peak, and this peak, and this peak. And so if you cut either a constant length and change the magnetic field, you see oscillations. If you cut a constant magnetic field and change the length, you see oscillations. Is everyone happy with that? Okay, you see maximum? Okay. But then, this is actually not what they see. Um, this is what they see sometimes. But then, what you occasionally see is you see a glitch. A glitch kind of like this. And the phase shifts by exactly um, this distance is exactly one third of this distance. Okay? So, what's, is that clear what, what I meant with that? The, the, the pattern shifts one third of its, its registry over. Okay. And then a little bit later, you'll see another shift. Another third, and then, and then another third to get back. So, what's going on there? So, what's going on is in any region of this length and magnetic field diagram, there is a, some number of quasi particles that are trapped inside that loop. Okay. It's just an energetic state. If the quasi-particles have to charge, they have to neutralize 
whatever charge happens to be there. So there's some number of polyparticles trapped inside that loop. Now, as you change the um, magnetic field and the length, remember when you're changing the length, you're also changing some of the energetics because because you're adding some voltage on the side, and you're changing some energetics when you change the magnetic field. Um, at some point, the energetics changes such that another quasi particle is favored. The ground state, the new ground state, requires another quasi particle to sit there. So the, the system sits in a ground state with, say, three quasi particles, but then when you cross over this line, the new ground state, the lowest energy state, has uh, an additional quasi particle that jumps in. And then you see this, when the particle jumps in, you see this shift in the interference pattern. And then a little while later, you need another quasi particle in, and you see another shift in the, in the interference pattern. And this is a fairly direct observation of this, of this gradient phase, and probably the most uh, direct one we have in the quantum Hall effect. Um, so, so I think I'm, I'm more or less out of time. Um, if, if people are interested, I can either answer questions or I can, I can explain why it is it took, it took you know, 40 years to, to do this experiment. It was, you know, as you see it here, it was not so bad, but it, it was actually quite difficult to make it work. Um, now it does, and so this is ushered in to the new era when we can start doing experiments on, on these type of particles. Anyway, thank you for your attention. Sure.